Amen. So John chapter 15, I know we're skipping a chapter here, but John chapter 15 has an analogy here that I want to use um, to explain one of the main themes of John chapter 14. These things kind of overlap each other because Jesus is giving this, um, he's giving this narrative, he's giving this last um, bit of advice to his disciples before he is arrested and crucified. And he is telling them what, you know, the, I've said this before, but the last words of somebody to you are generally the most important that they're going to give you. So he's giving them, you know, advice for what to do and how to act when he is gone, when he, when he knows he's going to be gone very soon. So look down at verse number um, 1 of John chapter 15. And let's look at this analogy here where Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. So he compares himself to a vine, a, a grapevine or whatever it is. Um, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So he gives this great example of just kind of pruning a, a tree or a vine, in this case, to make it more productive. This is real. People do this. It's an actual practice, right? People um, talk to Brother Trevor after the service. He'll tell you exactly how they do it and why they do it in the specific ways so they can, you know, they can improve what? They can improve their yield. They get more fruit out of the tree, all right? So Jesus is talking about how to get fruit out of us, out of the Christian. So he's saying, abide in the true vine, abide in me. Every branch that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth, that it may bring forth more fruit. So if there's a branch that is um, bringing forth fruit, he's going to work on that branch, focus on that branch, to make sure it keeps bringing forth fruit and any you know thing that gets in the way or any little offshoot of something that's worthless or not you know this is God attacking the worthless things in your life through chastisement to what to make you more fruitful as a Christian he says now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. So now he is telling you how to be a fruitful branch. You must abide in him, the vine. The, the, the main trunk is what he's comparing it to. No more can ye except ye abide in me. He's saying you can't bear fruit unless you abide in the vine. Again in verse 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Obviously, the vine by itself would just wither and die. If you just look at this analogy, it's a, it's a great analogy. If a man abideth not in me, verse 6, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. All right? So this is where the Pentecostal preacher would stand up and say, if you don't come to church, you're going to burn. You know, if you don't come to church, if you don't abide in the vine, you know, you're going to burn, and they'll take that burn and make it like you're going to burn in hell. He's like, no, he's, he's talking about an analogy of sticks and branches and vines here. So he's literally saying that this is what somebody would do with branches that have been worthless, that are on the ground, that are doing nothing. This is the dead faith that's no profit to anyone. This is what he's talking about. If you have no works with your faith, you are not unsaved. You are just worthless Amen. to anyone. And what do you do with a worthless bunch of sticks? You just get rid of them. You just burn them. All right? He's not talking about burning in hell. He's talking, about, he's talking about an analogy here of branches. Okay? If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Now we see something different here. We're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so you shall be my disciples. So here, he says, uh, and it's a really great example of the definition of what a disciple is right here in verse number 8. A lot of people are confused about this in Christianity today. As a matter of fact, many modern Bible versions are confused about what a disciple is. If you look at Matthew 28, well, you don't even have to turn there. If you just go to, you know, Matthew 28, you know, where the Bible says, Go ye and teach all nations in the King James Bible. In most of the modern Bible versions, it says, Go ye therefore making disciples and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. So it conflates salvation with being a disciple. But the real Bible, the King James Bible, does not conflate that. And if you look at verse number 8, what is a disciple? 
A disciple is something, is, is, a, is a saved person that bears much fruit. That is the disciple. So that's the end game. And how are they bearing fruit? Like, how do I bear fruit? They abide in the vine. That's how they do it. So a saved believer that abides in the vine, and Jesus defines that as the word that follows the word, that abides in Jesus. Jesus is the word. This isn't a stretch. It fits perfectly. They will bear fruit. And that is a disciple. So is every saved person a disciple? No. no. Disciple and, you know, saved, those are not two mutually exclusive groups. They do not completely, one is a subset of the other. A disciple is a subset of the people that are saved. And Jesus is trying to make sure that all of his disciples remain disciples. Was, I mean, was his concern unfounded as Peter went a-fishing and took everyone with him right after the crucifixion and Jesus had to literally resurrect and go find Peter and remind him of this? This is not unfounded concern that he's giving advice. And look, it's, it's advice that we need to hear as well. Look at verse number 10. Again, John 14, 15. It says basically the same thing. It says, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Even I have kept my, I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. If you just look at John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. So a disciple is somebody that is loving God. A disciple is somebody that is loving Jesus. Just because you're saved, remember, love isn't some feeling of butterflies that you have. Love is action that you take. So somebody that loves God is somebody that is not only saved, but is doing what God wants them to do. Is doing what? Abiding in this vine. Okay? These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. So the reason I went to John 15 is because John 14, 12, 13, 14, and 15 basically cover the same idea of doing what God says. Jesus is saying, when I'm gone... Continue in my word. Continue doing what I've asked you to do. Abide in the vine. These things have I spoken unto you. Verse 11, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Now, verse 12 through verse 15, we see like a gear shift here. And I want you to remember this, okay? We see this idea, this connection of abiding in the vine to friendships, to brothers and sisters in Christ. He says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends. If, don't miss this, if ye do whatsoever I command you. So if any of us in this room decide next week to just throw off the Christian life, we're not throwing off our salvation, but are we friends of Jesus at that point? No, we are not. So Jesus is making a connection between abiding in the vine and friendship. Not just friendship with him. Friendship with each other. Look at verse number 15. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you, again he says, friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go, for, go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. There's something different. Again, these things I command you that you love one another. So now he's back to the friendship. And look at verse number 18. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love its own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Okay, now I'm going to break these into two things, two categories here, okay? But the main theme is here is he's telling them to abide in the vine. He's telling them to abide in the vine, and then he gives them, he gives them two main benefits that he repeats over and over about benefits to you for abiding in the vine. So what is abiding in the vine? Abiding in the vine is... Abiding in Jesus, God's word. 
Abiding in the vine is abiding in the word of God in your life. I mean, what, that, that encompasses everything in your spiritual life. That's, that encompasses having a spiritual walk with God. That encompasses church. That encompasses outside church. That encompasses your entire spiritual life right there, abiding in the vine. That encompasses your prayer life, your, your Bible reading life, your family life, how you lead your family men, how you teach your children ladies. It, it encompasses your entire spiritual life, abiding in the Word of God. And Jesus is talking about the importance of that. You say, well, is this sermon about coming to church? No, it's about abiding in the vine. It's about abiding in the Word of God. That is, that is every time, if you never read it, you can't abide in it. If you don't know what's in it, you can't abide in it. When you hear it preached, abide in it. When you hear it preached, do it. When you read it on your own, do it. When you, when you pray, when you pray, you know, set, side a time, uh, set time aside for the Lord in your life, when you teach your children, how, how are you going to teach your children if you don't know what is, is in, the, in the Bible? This is talking about abiding in the Word of God, which means you need to understand what the Word of God is. But it is saying, when you do understand it, you have to do it. That is what abiding in the vine is. But then Jesus gives us. So I'm not going to push that too hard. That, that's pretty Christianity 101 right there. But he actually gives two advantages to you in this chapter of abiding in the vine. You're like, what do you mean advantages? I'm saved. Yeah, you're saved. You're going to get rewards in heaven. And, you know, if you abide in the vine and you bear fruit, you're stacking up rewards in heaven. But God is telling you, you're going to have benefits here in your life if you abide in the vine. And he gives two of those benefits. And he's saying, well, I mean, one's a, one's a, they're both a benefit, but they both have opposite effects as well. And that's why he's telling everybody. So I'm going to give you the two advantages. I, I hope I don't get too off the rails tonight and, and deep about this, but... There, there's a lot here, okay? And I want you to see these two advantages first. So I'm going to keep it basic, and then I'm going to kind of apply it, you know, to our overall lives and our, in our world that we're living in today, all right? So I'm, let me just show you the two advantages. The first one is this. The first one is this, and it's in verse 12 through 15. It's in verse 17. The first advantage that Jesus gives to abiding in him, abiding in his word, is your friends. He's saying, if you want to keep and have your friends and love your friends and have your, you know, be in this great relationship with your friends, of which I am one of them, he says, you are my friends if you abide in the vine. He's saying, abiding in the vine equals loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what he is equating here in these verses. Okay? Now look, then he goes into, if you look down at verse number, I, I, don't want you to, I don't want you to miss what he talks about in verse number 18 and verse number 19. Because if you read it real quick, you can kind of be like, yeah, that seems kind of random that he just kind of threw that in there about the world. But you have to understand that what he is saying, he's explaining that there is two sides here. He's explaining that there's the vine and then there is the world. He's explaining these two categories and he's saying, look, he's saying, look, if you're in the world, they're going to like you there. They're going to be friends with you. They're going to love you. But he's not talking about that. He's talking about them loving each other. He's talking about them being in fellowship with each other and him. So he spends the whole chapter saying abide in the vine. Then he goes and he says, but if in the world... If in the vine, the world's going to hate you. If in the world, the world will love you. Okay, but he is talking about, who's he talking to? He's talking to his crew. He's talking to the 12 disciples here. Well, 11, I guess. But he's talking to the main inner circle that is going to be going out and spreading his word. And he's going to give them some tools for that, and I'm going to talk about that next week, the tools that he gives us as Christians to go out, the, the main tool that he gives us. But he's saying, look, if you all want to stay together, you must be in the vine, not in the world, is what he is saying. He's like, if you go to the world, they will love you there. 
but if you're in the vine, they're not going to like you. And then he tells them why, and he's like, it's because of me. So he's saying, look, bear fruit, and you will love one another, is, is basically what he is saying. You will have good friendships, all right? The world will hate you, though. But if you were in the world, then they would love you. So what's more important to you? He's basically putting them to a decision here. And everyone is going to need to be in their Christian life if they bear fruit in their Christian life. Everyone will be put to that decision. Whether they want to be loved by the world or they want to be loved by their friends, their brothers and sisters in Christ. They want to, be lo they want to love their brothers and sisters in Christ and they want to love Jesus Christ mainly. Okay? He spends the whole chapter talking about this. But, I mean, the point is this. A lot of people will think, though, that they can be in the world and in the vine. And this is what Jesus is saying. No, you cannot. And I'm here to tell you tonight, you cannot. And I want to explain some things that you will see in churches. And it's, it, if you don't understand this, the things that you will see in a Bible-preaching church that is bearing fruit. You won't see this in every church. You won't see this in many churches, but in a Bible preaching church that is bearing fruit, you will see strange things happen, but it is because you can't be in the vine and in the world. That's why. Go to Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 30. So everyone will be put to a decision. It, it can't be one or the other. Look, you say, I know a lot of... I know a lot of Christians, that they're very worldly, but, you know, they still say they believe they read their Bible and, and their kids are pretty decent and all this kind of stuff. They just don't really go to church. And they, are they bearing fruit? See? That is the difference here. The difference is fruit-bearing Christians. And Jesus is saying, if you're going to be, that's why I've said many times to people that start soul winning, <clears throat> I've said many times, like, hey, your life is going to change. Things are going to happen. You know, you're going to be under attack. You know, things are going to change once you, look, salvation's a big change. Look, that's spiritual death to life right there. But the next thing is when you, I mean, the next big change, when you start bearing fruit, you're going to see changes. And it's because of what Jesus is talking about here. He's saying if you're in the vine, you're going to bear fruit. And if you bear fruit, the world's coming after you for it. They're not going to like it. Look at Matthew 12, 30. It says, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Jesus himself says, there is no middle. You're either in the vine or you're in the world. Okay, so look, if you're not in the world, you're in the vine, but then you fall into the world. See, this can happen too. There's no guarantee that, I mean, hey, you're all in the vine right now. Good for you. You know, you're in the vine, you're bearing fruit, and I mean, you look at our, our soul winning ministry, I mean, we're bearing fruit. Amen. It's awesome, but there's no guarantee that next week you will still be in the vine. Amen. Because you have to continue to abide. He doesn't say abide five minutes and then you're like set. It's kind of like a marriage, right? I mean, I joked about that before. I mean, I had a friend one time, he got, he got divorced after 12 years, and I was like, man, when are you good? He's like, no, you got to keep abiding. You got to abide. You have to keep abiding. But it's interesting because he says, if you fall into the world, you know, the love between you and your brother will go away. He equates those two things. And you wonder, I've often wondered, I've often wondered before I understood this, <coughs> I often wondered how it was so easy for people, you know, I don't know what the, the average Christian life is or whatever, but people fall out of the Christian life all the time. It is not, I mean, look, I, I'm sorry to report this, but it is not uncommon for people to fall out of the Christian life. I've heard Pastor Jimenez say many times in sermons that I feel like I've pastored several churches. And he's talking about the turnover in the Christian life. And thank God, you know, we go back and we visit, and there is this strong core of people that, you know, don't turn over there. So, I mean, that just, that really, those people really give me hope. That it's, that it's possible to abide in the vine. 
But what he's saying is, this explains why, this explains what Jesus is saying, explains why it's so easy for people to stay in a motorcycle club. You see, people can stay in 4-H. People can stay in, you know, baseball programs. They can stay in, you know, Cub Scouts or whatever. I mean, you read somebody's obituary. And they were in the Rotary Club for 45 years or whatever. You know, he was a member of the American Legion or the Elks Lodge for 60 years, you know? Like, how in the world is some, are these people able to stay in these things? And then saved believers can't stay in the Christian life for more than four years or whatever the average is. And, and the answer, I mean, it seems confusing, right? The answer is all those clubs and everything, that's the world. Yep, that's, right. that's why. It's the world, and, and the world loves them, no matter what. The, you know, the legions and the clubs and all those things, they just, they just love them. They just love them because they all, they're just in the world. This is exactly what Jesus is saying here. It's, you're not going to find, look folks, they're very shallow and they're very worldly, and there's no spiritual aspect to it at all. That's why it's so easy to hang with it. But when you think about, like, this group of people, I mean, you are never going to find anyone who is closer to believing like you than these people right here. And then you will have somebody get out of the vine and into the world on whatever aspect it is, whatever vine grows out of them that pulls them out of the vine, and then they, they leave this love, this group, their friends, and they still believe like this, which is crazy because they're never going to find. Like, and even if they disagreed on one thing, they still believe 99.999% exactly the same. Yet you say, how, how does it happen? Why would that happen? Because they didn't abide in the vine. That's why. This is what Jesus is saying. He's like, if you want to keep this group of friends... Abide in the vine. And he's saying, if you abide in the vine, you will keep your friends. This is what he's saying. Because he, what does Jesus want? <clears throat> he wants them to stick together. He doesn't want them dividing into 11 different groups that argue over some tiny little thing or whatever, or getting some personal argument. He's saying, no, that will not happen to you if you abide in the word of God. Amen. And you are bearing fruit together. But there's no guarantee that because you're abiding today, you will abide tomorrow. It is something you must continue doing. But look, folks, what I'm trying to say is Jesus has given you a promise here that you're going to have strong friendships. That's why we say lifelong friendships. Lifelong friendships, maybe it should say, as long as you abide in the vine. <laughs> That's a little deep for someone who's never been to our church, maybe. But that is what Jesus is explaining. It's possible, yes, but everybody must abide. And if somebody falls out and doesn't abide, that's when that break is going to happen. The answer is, it's a spiritual thing. It's just how it works. That's what Jesus is explaining. He's explaining the mechanics of things. All those other things are in the world, and you know what? It will love you. You go off and you do the things that the world wants you to do, it will love you, right up into, to the point where it kills you. But that's why he's saying, that's why there's five verses talking about the vine is where your brother is. He's trying to convince them to stay in it. He's trying to give some benefit here for them to stay in the vine. But every believer must choose and must work to keep abiding to see this promise. So the first one is your friends, your brothers and sisters. All right. The second one is this. And this is a, I don't know why this isn't preached more. Maybe I should preach this more, but look at verse number 7 of uh, John 15. And it's repeated, it's repeated in John 14 as well, but look, look at John 15 and verse number uh, 7, where Jesus says, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Whoa, there's a good one. That sounds like a promise. Look at verse 16. He says it twice. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And ordained you that you should go for go and what? Again, what is abiding? What's the point of abiding in the vine? It's to bring forth fruit. 
and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. You know what he's literally saying here? He's saying if you abide and you bring forth fruit, I will answer your prayers. I mean, who doesn't want that one? He's saying the Father will listen to you if you abide in my words. And I mean, you're sitting there thinking, well, God doesn't, doesn't God hear everyone pray, everyone's prayers? Well, the answer is no, he doesn't. God doesn't listen to many people's prayers. Look at, uh, go to Proverbs 15. This is all over the Bible. We go to Bible verse all day on this. Look at Proverbs 15, verse 29. Proverbs 15, verse number 29. It is really hot up here. Is it, is it hot in here or is it just me? Am I burning up from fever? No, it, I'm okay? All right. All right, Proverbs 15. Look at verse number 29. The Bible says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. So he's saying he doesn't hear their prayers. He does hear these people's prayers. Proverbs 28, verse number 9. The Bible says, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. That sounds exactly like John chapter 15. He's saying, someone that takes my word, I mean, this could be a saved person in Proverbs 28, verse 9. It's exactly what Jesus is telling the disciples. He's saying, if you hear my word and you turn away from it, I'm not going to hear your prayers. He's saying the exact other side of the coin that Jesus is telling the disciples in John 15. Look at Jeremiah. Go to turn to Jeremiah chapter 14. So don't turn away your ear from hearing the law. I mean, this is why the Bible teaches it would be better to not know. It would be better to not know the law than to hear the law preached, read the law, hear about it, and then say, no, I'm not going to do it. Because then you get that fiery indignation. When you know what the Bible says, I mean, it's better to sin in ignorance. I mean, it doesn't mean you should just, hey, I'll remain ignorant then. That's not the right answer. Look at Jeremiah chapter 14. But the point is, God doesn't listen to everybody's prayers. Look at John, uh, Jeremiah 14, verse 11. Then said the Lord unto me, pray not for this people for their good. He's saying, there's certain people out there, don't pray for good for them because I'm not going to listen. When they fast, and what kind of people are these? Look at this and see if you can parallel this with today. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. These people are even fasting. And he's like, fast away, starve yourself to death. I don't care. When they offer burnt offering and oblation, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. God's wrath is coming down on these people. The sword is coming to these people. Then said, then, I, then said I, O Lord God, behold, the prophet say unto them, You shall not see the sword. So they got these pastors that are telling them everything's going to be fine. They got these pastors that are saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Because if the pastor is saying, Peace, peace, and God's coming with a sword, there's no peace. God is saying, Don't pray for their good. It's not going to do you any good. I'm not going to listen. Then said the Lord unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. So he kind of pro he, he prophesies against the pastors that are lying to these people. But look at verse 15. He say, oh, these poor people. These poor people are sitting in these churches where these pastors are just saying, peace, peace, everything's great. God's not mad. God accepts you as you are. God has no rules. God has no standards. Everything's abomination. Yeah, we have a Bible that doesn't have the word abomination in it. We've changed the word of God to where it's nice everywhere. And these people, these poor people, they sit in these churches and they don't know. And, you know, these poor, look at verse 15. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, I sent them not, yet they say, sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. This is Christian churches today, right here. But look at verse 15. It says, and the people whom they prophesy, to whom they prophesy, shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword, and they shall have none to bury them, their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour their wickedness upon them. God's not going to hear their prayers. He's saying don't pray for those people, in verse 16, that followed those wicked prophets. So look, they're going to be, the people are responsible. I mean, we're trying to reach these people, for sure. But 
if they don't want to hear the truth and instead they want to hear people say there is no sword, peace, peace, that's on them. And those prayers will not be heard by the Lord. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. Husbands. Husbands. The Lord says that if a husband is not a, a good husband, the Lord, God's not going to hear his prayers. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. The Bible says, likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. What's that? What kind of knowledge do you think that is? God's saying, like, you know what? Treat, lead your home like I tell you to. Abide in my word on how to lead your home. Giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. He's like, you know what? Respect your wife, love your wife, care for your wife. Or what? As being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. He's like, if you don't do what I'm saying, if you don't take care of your wife, if you don't love your wife like Christ loved the church, he's like, I'm not even going to hear your prayers. I mean, that's a pretty big deal. I mean, there's times when we can treat God in a way, and what? Jesus is saying, if you don't abide in the vine. So there's a promise in John 15. Abide in the vine and I'll hear your prayers. Don't. And I won't. I mean, this is why I'm so hard on husbands. I'm way harder on husbands. You say, why? Because they're the leaders. God's hard on the husbands. You read 1 Peter 3, 7, he's like, that's pretty harsh on the husband. There's not an equivalent verse for the wife because he's in charge. He's in charge. When it all falls apart, God's going to hold him responsible, just like he holds the pastor responsible. For what happens to his church on earth. Jeremiah 14, Jeremiah 23. So look, the brass tacks of it is, is this. You want your prayers answered? You got a great promise here in John 15. Abide in the vine, bearing fruit, and God will answer your prayers. That is a serious promise right there. See, the problem is, I mean, take the promises. Take the promises from God. It's not like maybe I'll think about it. He's like, no, I'll answer your prayers. Being right with God, bearing fruit equals answered prayers. And it makes sense. Like, I think people's consciences even know this. I think people, even outside our church, you know how many times we get contacted through email or whatever? Like, could you pray for us? I don't even know who these people are. But what do they do? They contact a church. They contact a pastor. They want to pray for them. Why? Because they want to find somebody that is right with God, that has a good relationship with God, and they assume that a pastor has that, and their conscience is even telling this. I mean, they're looking for a spiritual proxy for them. They're looking for uh, a Moses. Could somebody give me a paper towel or something? I'm gonna, my glasses are going to fog up on me here. So they're looking for an advocate. I mean, isn't this what Moses was, by the way? Like, just this great advocate? I mean, how many times, how many times did God, you know, right after they came out of Egypt, God's like, I'm just going to wipe them all out. And Moses is like, no. He's like, don't do it. And then he gives like this great, you know, um, great defense of the people of Israel. Not necessarily what they did, but he's like, the heathen. The heathen will see that you saved these people, and then you just wipe them out right away. And he's like, they won't understand that. He's like, don't do it. Don't wipe them out. So, I mean, pe that's why people do it. They're looking for an advocate that's right with God. And, I mean, it, it's smart. It makes sense because that's exactly what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about abiding in the vine, and he'll answer your prayers. And look, God changed his mind. God listened to Moses. He didn't wipe him out because of Moses being an advocate. But look, it's easier to be right yourself. It's easier to just be abiding in the vine, bearing fruit yourself, and then God will just listen to you. You don't have to, you know, call me up and be like, hey, I'm not right with God. Could you pray for me, please? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But, I mean... Literally, it's the same thing as like a, it, just think of a father-son relationship. Think of a father-son relationship and you have, some, you have some disobedient child that is 16 years old and every single time his dad gives him a little bit of slack, he just wrecks everything, gets in trouble, you know, hurts people. And then this kid comes to his dad and says, hey dad, can I borrow the car keys tonight? What do you think his dad's going to say? He's going to say, just get out of my sight. 
Whereas if you have an obedient son and he asks a favor from his father, of course his father is going to be like, I'm, just going to, I'm not going to give you a rock. I'm going to give you what you ask for. This is what Jesus is talking about. And it makes perfect sense. See, people think, the problem is, people think that, people don't think that they really need prayer. So when you think about abiding in the vine, or you think about slipping into the world, people don't think about this because they don't really think that they need prayer. They don't really think about being right with God because they're like, I don't really need prayer right now. But when they, well, look, when you need prayer, you need prayer. So it's better to be right with God bearing fruit so when you need prayer you have prayer because a lot of people are just like oh everything's great i'm never going to need to pray and they don't pray for weeks and weeks or months and months or whatever it is but then you know what uh, they need to call 911 and they've been in the world and god's not hearing it when the sickness hardship comes in or whatever it is you know now they want the prayer now they want the advocate it's better just to stay right with God. It's better to just stay in the vine and not have to worry about this. So look, we see two great promises here, okay? Being fruitful has benefits here on earth. Being fruitful, <coughs> yeah, we're, we're stacking up rewards in heaven. We're stacking up those everlasting rewards. I get that. We get that too. But God is telling us, your friends is a benefit of abiding in the vine. Like your true friends. Not your, your friends of the world that are not even your friends. Those are just advocates for sin. He's saying your true friendships depend on abiding in me and staying fruitful. And then he's saying your answered prayers depend on abiding in the vine. Two very powerful promises that we see from Jesus. Now, let me just give you one last thought here. And I hope this makes sense, because it, I was rattling it around in my head for a couple days, and it just kind of, here's a great irony for you, okay? We see this lesson of abiding in the vine so we can bear fruit. Clearly, this is the last thing that Jesus is saying to the disciples, and it's the very thing that many of the disciples failed at first, as they ran back to their worldly jobs and just kind of left the Christian life until he kind of shook them back into it. But let me just give you some irony here. here, here's, an, here here's some irony for you. People generally, people generally overestimate their self-importance, except where it counts. That's ironic. People generally think that in my life, I'm the most important person at work. I'm the most, they, they could never do without me, all these types of things. They generally overestimate this. It's a, it's a common thing. Yet they will completely miss the things that God actually wants them to be doing in their life. I mean, that's, that's irony right there. Let me give you an example of this. And I hope I can string this together for you that makes sense. But <clears throat> Gen Z or whatever this 15-year-old uh, and younger or 20-year-old and younger generation that's coming up today is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give an example of what I've been saying a couple times in our fellowship where I'm saying if you want to understand what's going to happen, you have to understand what happened. The best way to tell the future is to understand what happened in the past. So here we have this Gen Z these kids under 20 that is the most confused, abused, and just confounded generation, damaged generation. And they're saying like 30% now of these kids think that they are some sort of LGBT, whatever it is. 30%. And you're just like, how in the world could something like that have happened? Well, I mean, let's just, let's just take it back to the 50s for sim simplicity, okay? In the 1950s, and I told you a bunch of stats on the family last week. I think it was, what was it, Sunday night? A bunch of stats and when this hockey stick rose up and, you know, people not being married. Let me give you another, another one. So we see this generation that's a complete train wreck right now. 
And I think there's a lot of confusion there. I don't really think that those numbers are the real um, thing that's going on, but it doesn't matter. There's a lot of uh, physical abuse and damage that's taking place there and very wicked things. You say, how could this happen? In the 1950s, the percentage of stay-at-home moms was about, it, uh, it was 20% of moms that worked outside the home. 80% of moms stayed home with their children. Today, I mean today, it's exactly the opposite. It's 20% that stay home, and it's 80% that go and work. And you say, wow, how did that happen? Well, one thing that I wish, one thing that I wish Christians were, were better at, and this is what Jesus is talking about, that Satan and the principalities and the powers are very good at is setting and achieving goals. So if you just think about what happened, you just think about Satan and the principalities and the powers, they had all these mothers at home, and they're like, what in the world? We can't get these kids. We've got to get them out of there. So what should we do? What should we do? I know what we should do. We could start a war. I'm not joking. You listen. We could start a war. This is how deep Satan thinks. This is not a conspiracy. This is what happened. We could start a war. Oh, there's this guy who doesn't want the war. We'll shoot him. We'll kill him. President of the United States, 1963, dead. Then now we can start a war. We can start a war and we can spend way more money than we have. And we can create this huge inflation problem. You want to know what's going to happen? You got to know what happened. Well, we got these war protesters. They started up and they don't like this war because the war makes no sense. People don't like the draft. They're starting to protest. Let's create, let's create some hippies. We'll create some hippies. We'll create rock and roll. We'll create moral or just get rid of morality. We'll create this sex, drugs, and rock and roll culture, and we'll just combine that into that anti-war movement, and then nobody will take it seriously because these people are going to be taken as a bunch of weirdos and freaks. That's exactly what happened. And we can continue our war, and we can continue spending all this money that we don't have. And guess what happened? In the 1970s, eventually, Eventually, people got tired of, you know, their sons not coming home. In the 1970s, eventually, it ended in the mid-70s. And the narrative, you know what's funny? I grew up in the 80s. And the narrative against the anti-war movement, it turns out those hippies on the anti-war part, they were correct. But if you look at the protesters before the hippie movement came on, they were just normal people that are like, hey, this is jacked. What are we doing? This doesn't make any sense. Nobody likes, you know, the, being f their, their, you know, their sons drafted into this disaster that's gonna, that, that ruined a, a, a generation of young men in this country or damaged them. I shouldn't say ruined, but damaged them. My wife just met a, a Vietnam vet the other day at the door, and he, he was, he was th these guys are in their 80s now. And he, he's like, he, it, it affected him his whole life. He's like, you can't, I'm just some normal California kid, you can't take some kid and put him into that and, and think that's not going to hurt. But anyway, the damage was done. And all of a sudden, if you look at, you know, what happened to the economy in the 70s, inflation went through the roof. And if you look at when all the women went to work, it was in the 70s. That's when the graph goes like this. Why? Because they had to. So Satan started the war, and he started all the, the immorality and the culture and all these different things. He got a lot of side benefits and all of it. But ultimately, what, he, what it came down to is we've got to get these moms out of those homes. And he did it. And I started this by saying that people, they, and here's the irony of the whole thing. Let's go back to my irony statement. The irony of the whole thing is people overestimate their importance. 
And look, I, and people, you know where they do it the most? In the workforce. Let me tell you something, men and women out there in the workforce, if you die and don't go to work tomorrow, they're going to move on without you. The analogy that I have seen is like someone taking their finger out of a glass of water. And there might be a little ripple, but eventually they're going to move. I don't care how good you are at your job, they are going to be able to move on without you. The difference is for the men, it is a calling. God tells them, go support your family. And instead, he's given this overly, you know, everyone has this self-importance, and he sold this to the women in this country, first out of necessity, but then they started to believe it through the lies of feminism. And it, it's not even important. It's not a matter of, look, I've worked with women in the workforce my entire career. They can do the job, uh, uh, you know, just like the men can do, and all, all these things, and, and whatever. That's not the point. The point is, they are missing where they are actually needed. Yep, that's it. They are missing where God actually wants them. They are missing, and then you look at this generation now that has no one, and the men are on board with it. The men are more to blame than the women. They're supposed to be protecting their families, leading their families. And everybody is missing their calling. They put all their importance over here, and these things don't even matter when they're supposed to be doing these things. And Jesus is saying, if you abide in the vine, you won't be confused about that. If you abide in the vine, you will know where your true calling is. You will know where God wants you. You will not have this great deception be able to affect you and your family. Because you will know. You abide in the vine and you will never misunderstand what God wants you to do. From bearing fruit to protecting your home. And, and that's just one example of what happened here. But again, if we want to know how we got here, if we want to know what happened, we, if we want to know what's going to continue to happen, we just have to look at what actually happened. And I mean, we need to set goals. I mean, why is Satan and the principalities and the powers the only one that can set goals like this and follow through on wicked plans like this? Why can't the Christians set goals for their family for their country and follow through on those goals. Yeah, Say, hey, these are lines that we're not going to cross. I mean, that's what we're doing as we abide in the vine. We're drawing lines with our families. Our, our kids aren't going there. You know, our kids, no, no, no. I'm not going to give my children over to the wicked, Satan-worshipping psychopath who's going to try to abuse them and destroy them and, 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 and spiritually, eternally ruin them yep. on top of the physical abuse. Abide in the vine and none of this would happen to any Christian. All we have to do is just abide right here. That's it. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.